I wanted to bring a little tip to you today about how to brown things without the use of any oil. Everyone's always asking me, how do you start these recipes? Are you browning onions without the use of oil? And I want to show you today, it's really simple. Olive oil doesn't add any flavor to your recipes. We've got grown accustomed to browning things using the oil so that it doesn't stick to the pan. But the flavor is really in the browning process. I'm heating up my pan a little bit here, but you don't have to heat it up before you add the onions. I have half of a white onion sliced and half of a red, just to show you it works with any type of onions. You could add garlic to this to start your recipe. This is a cast iron enamel coated pan. You could use a stainless steel pan, which is what I usually use. I'm using this pan today because I'm going to start these onions up to make roastless pot roast. So I'm just going to put this on medium high heat. You can put it up to high heat, get this going faster. And you're going to leave these onions alone and just let them brown. Don't be worried, it's going to stick to the pan, but as soon as we add a liquid, it's going to release from the bottom of the pan. So I'm going to keep a liquid handy for when that happens. Today I'm using a vegetable stock or a vegetable broth. You could use water, or you could use red wine, whatever it calls for in the recipe that you're creating that day. Today I'm going to use vegetable broth. So just be patient with this. You don't have to stir it, you don't have to mess with it, just keep a close eye on it. Okay. These onions are going to start to give off some moisture and as you can see they're starting to brown on the bottom of the pan. That's what gives you all the flavor, not the oil. It's the browning on the bottom of the pan and the browning of the onions or the garlic or mushrooms you can do. With mushrooms it takes a little longer because they're going to give off a lot of moisture. So you see all this good brown stuff that's happening at the bottom of the pan? It's a wonderful thing. This is what gives our soups and our sauces all the flavor. Olive oil is completely nutrient empty. There's no vitamins and nutrients in olive oil. So that's why I'm cooking without it. We're just adding 120 calories of pure fat every time you add a tablespoon of olive oil to your dishes. Turn this down a little bit. But as you can see, my onions are getting nice and golden brown and all this color to the bottom of my pan. But they're not burning. You want to catch them before they start to turn black. This is adding a lot of flavor, what's there so far, and I'm just going to add my vegetable broth to it. Now, if you were making a soup, you could add a lot of vegetable stock, but what I'm doing is I'm stopping the browning process, and I'm getting that brown flavor off the bottom of the pan by adding the liquid and stirring it up. So if I was making a dish that wasn't going to be a soup, you'd add less liquid just to get that to stop, stop cooking so that it doesn't get to a burning step and just to mix in that flavor. Now if you were doing a stir fry, you could add other vegetables to this after you get that brown flavor from your onion and steam them a little bit with the broth. But depending on the recipe, as you can see on plantpurity.com, I have a lot of recipes where I start with browning of onions, and that is the process. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something new today. Take care, and remember, optimum health will be owned by those who eat an abundance of plants, so eat your fruits and veggies. Best of health to you. Well. Let's get started now. <laughs> we have a bunch of at-home viewers. We broadcast globally. No one can see you guys on the camera but me. And um, <coughs> this is so that we can reach a lot more people than what's in our classroom in front of us today. And welcome. This is our final class here with um, Humana in Naperville. We're moving to California in a month and a half, so we had to call it quits. We've been teaching here for a year now and been loving it. We love the reception we got from you guys, and thanks for coming to all the classes. And um, our subject today is budget-friendly meals on a healthy diet. So who here thinks that healthy meals are expensive, that it's expensive to eat healthy? Does anyone think it is? Kind of, a little bit? You think it's expensive to eat healthy? If you go to Whole Foods. If you shop at Whole Foods, okay. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I agree. And there's certain products at Whole Foods that I do buy, and I'm very selective about what store I shop at. So we're going to go through some of those tips because I want you to leave today realizing that it's not expensive to eat healthy. It's actually less expensive to eat healthy if we focus on whole plant-based foods. If we compare, we can get caught up in health food products that are packaged and sold to us as healthy. They say healthy all over them. We're paying for the label. We're paying for the box. We're paying for the processing. So the less processed foods are, the less expensive they are because they're less expensive to manufacture. I mean, you take garlic for an example. This is a very inexpensive item at the grocery store, but if you buy it pre-chopped and in a jar and ready to go, filled with food additives, it's expensive. And there's a lot of junk in that garlic if you read the label because it's staying good in your refrigerator for over a year. Yeah. I see this in a lot of my students' homes. I do in-home cooking classes, and they have this huge jar of garlic. And I can't even imagine eating that in a year, and we eat a lot of garlic. I buy bulk garlic from Costco, and um, I freeze it. I break the cloves off individually, and I put them in a zipper bag, and I freeze it. And I use a garlic press, and I press it through, frozen straight into my soup, straight into my dishes. And that saves me a lot of money because I'm buying the garlic as it was grown in nature. I'm not paying for a package. I'm not paying for the designers that created the label on the package, the people they had to pay to create the contents and the ingredients and get it approved and packaged. So that's where we cut a lot of costs eating whole plant-based foods. <clears throat> on a weekly basis, Jerry and I eat a protective diet, which is a low-fat, whole foods, plant-based diet. It's oil-free and it's nut-free, and um, those ingredients are very expensive. Nuts are very expensive. Oil is very expensive, and oil is very processed. <coughs> we eliminate a lot of the expensive items out of our diet. We spend about $70 a week on all of our meals. And we're eating well. I would say we eat probably about 90% organic. And that's because we order a lot of our grains on Amazon through the mail. We look for the best deals. We look for sales. We buy in bulk. But we're eating a lot of the same grains all the time. Like most of you are, are maybe you use the same pasta every week. And when you see it's on sale, you're going to buy that in bulk. You're going to buy more of it. So that's what I teach in my classes and help my students to cut their grocery bills in half. That's my goal, not only to get them healthy. So I always suggest that you let the produce section guide you on your purchases. So you go to the grocery store and you find onions are on sale. Well, you were going to buy onions anyway. And this week, red onions at my produce store were 39 cents a pound. And they were the most beautiful, fresh-looking onions I could imagine picking out. Now, I love the sweet onions, the sweet yellow onions, but they didn't look that great, and they were 99 cents a pound. So I bought the red onions this week. They were fresher because the store had more of them, and that's why they put them on sale. So there I saved a lot of money. I cut my onion bill by a third. So I bought quite a few of them. I store them in a dark place in my kitchen in a drawer, and they're good for a few weeks. I have my onions. I want you to do this with all of your produce. So when you go to the store, don't go with a list of what I want to make that week. Go to the store and see what produce is fresh. The red bell peppers were on sale. So I bought a bunch of those. I came home and I looked up on the website. There's a search box. You can put bell peppers, red bell peppers, and it'll pull up all the recipes using red bell peppers. And there's stuffed bell peppers, there's fajitas. So I go with what's on sale that week at the grocery store to lead my meal plan. I don't create a meal plan until I know what I'm going to save money on in the store. And it kind of makes for a variety in my diet, too. I don't buy the same color potatoes every week. I buy what potatoes are on sale. And it might be sweet potatoes that week. It might be red, yellow. And that's how it varies my diet, by going with what's on sale. And it also cuts my grocery bills. So I'm going to start with the veggie, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with the yellow lentil soup. I'm doing this recipe today because I want to show you how you can stretch a few dollars with your, with your meals. Soup is always a great one. You can make a big pot of it and freeze batch, part of the batch, or you can eat on it throughout the week. So, 
We always start our soups with onions, and you watch the browning onions video before class. So anyone that's at home that's tuning in with us today, there is a browning onions without oil video that's available on Protective Diet's YouTube channel. It's also on the website under videos. I suggest watching that because in this Humana classroom, we can't use any heat. So I'm just going to explain the process of browning onions. Oh, and I forgot, I have a, I'm tossing my onion peels. But I want you to save these onion peels. I brought with something that I store in my freezer. And this is how I make my vegetable broth. This is what I've labeled a VBB. That's what we call it, a veggie broth baggie. And these are all my scraps from cooking. Onion peels. Did you put all of that in one soup recipe? Yes. The whole bag. This whole bag I put straight into my pressure cooker or into a stock pot like this, and I fill it with water. Now you have a recipe on there. It's one of the premium recipes on our website, but I gave that to you today. It's for veggie broth. And there's a few added ingredients that I add to this that are listed there. There's some dried spices that I add to my veggie broth. If you want to add salt, I listed there what's sodium-free, low sodium, and, and classic vegetable broth measurements. Um, but I just want to share this little tip, because this makes so much better of a veg vegetable broth than a box of vegetable broth. This is like my golden broth. When I make this broth, I use this broth in a soup that it's going to be um, more broth-based, where I really taste it. Making this homemade broth, I could eat the broth on plain rice. It's so beautiful and delicious. Can you wash them? Do I wash? Yeah, I wash, the, I wash my onions before I cut them. I want to take picture to kick this back. This, I made in about a week. Um, a week. Is not going to be rotten? Pardon me? Is not going to become rotten? No, I keep it in the freezer. Oh. I had it in a cold pack here, so I could bring it with to show you guys what I came up with in a week. So when I made the batch of soup that I'm serving you today, I cut up my bell pepper. I put the top in. My celery stems. And I've got onion peels here. I have some dill. I made pickles last, like, the beginning of the week. Um, celery tops. What else do I have in here? The celery ends. I have mushroom stems. I have the end of a tomato that I didn't use. I have some diced tomatoes because we had um, vegetarian tacos the other night and I diced, tomato, or I diced onions to put on top with tomatoes and we didn't eat them all. Well, I wasn't going to wrap them up and put them in the refrigerator because I probably wouldn't eat them, so I dump them in my veggie broth baggie. And this baggie fills up pretty quick if you're cooking at home and making lots of soups. But even if I had this in my freezer door for four or five months, you want to put it in a handy place. Your freezer door would be the best place so that when you're chopping and peeling onions, you'll have the tendency to throw them into the garbage or the disposal or even in the compost and waste them there rather than saving them for your broth if this isn't in a convenient place in your freezer. Um, but this is a great tip that most of my students do and it, it produces some unbelievably great broth using that recipe. And it's free. How long do you keep it in the freezer as long as you want? I usually, you can keep it in the freezer up to six months. Anything freezes well, any vegetables. But I usually use mine, I use my veggie broth baggie probably after about six weeks. It's full. It's full in my house. But uh, pepper, pepper. When you you use inside the seed also you freeze? Yeah, you can put the seeds in, that's fine. Because you're gonna boil it in a stock pot mm -hmm. and simmer it and let it get all of the flavors out of the vegetables. Once the vegetables look kind of um, clear in color, they're not looking very flavorful anymore, your broth is done. There's on the recipe, you could also do it in the pressure cooker for about five minutes mm -hmm. and then strain it. So you'll strain it like this mm -hmm. and put it into jars and freeze it or you could put it in Ziploc baggies and freeze it, however you want to do it. Or use it that day to make a really nice soup is usually what I do. I use it fresh. 
Um, you want to avoid putting bitter vegetables into your broth. So no spinach, no kale, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Those are going to make your broth really bitter. So stick with the sweeter vegetables, your carrot tops, your celery, anything that you would see on the outside of a vegetable broth box. If you're cleaning... Do you use a slow cooker also for making broth? No. No, a slow cooker isn't really necessary. You can put it in a stock pot like this on the stove and just bring it to a boil and let it simmer about a half an hour. Is better or um, pressure cooker is better? I like the pressure cooker because it's faster. faster. Okay. Yeah, and it's I don't have to babysit it on the stove. It's Julie? Just, yes. Um, you said we can put it in jars. You have to have special glass jar, freezer jars. Yes, glass, there's glass. freezer safe mason jars. And those you can find on the website under products, there will be an example on them. But the way you can tell is, see how this jar curves out like this? Mm -hmm. This is not freezer safe. The jars that go straight up and down, they're about this size. Mm -hmm. There's a pint jar and a pint and a half size jar that are freezer safe. There will also be a little line at the top of the jar that says freezer fill line. That's how you know it's a freezer safe jar. I like the jars because I can recycle them. I always try to be environmentally conscious and not use Ziploc bags. So the jars are nice. I can throw them in the, in the dishwasher and reuse them for food storage. But for some people, they don't fit well in their freezer. I have a really little freezer, but I don't have any meat in my freezer. So I have a lot of room. So chop. Make a nice dice of the onions. What do they sell those freezer jars? Pardon me? What do they sell the freezer jars? The freezer jars you can find at any big box store um, from Walmart to Target, Myers, uh, Ace Hardware, your hardware stores have them. Um, they're everywhere or online. I buy a lot of things online and save money because I can compare prices. And then I don't even have to go to the store. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> charge your ship. Charging ship? Yeah. Charge okay. shipping? Actually, sometimes the shipping is free. Mm -hmm. And um, with Amazon, I have Amazon Prime. So my ship, I always buy everything that's on Prime and then the shipping's free. If you buy a lot of things online, you'll find the different companies that offer deals on shipping. They're out there. Okay, so you're going to put the onions into the pot. If you're using a pressure cooker, you're going to put them into your pressure cooker like this. And on the pressure cookers, there's a brown setting. If you, if you don't have a pressure cooker and you're thinking about buying a pressure cooker, make sure you buy a pressure cooker that has a browning button. That just means that the bottom of the pressure cooker is going to heat and allow you to brown your onions and then go ahead and cook. This pressure cooker is also designed, it can be used as a slow cooker, so it's kind of nice. You can brown and then slow cook as well. But um, you're putting the onions in the pot. Now you're going to brown them, just like I showed you on that video. Allow them to brown and they're looking good and I give them a stir every so often. It takes about five minutes to get a nice golden brown color on them. And then you're going to add your vegetable broth. You can use a box of vegetable broth, it's four cups, or you could make your own broth using your veggie broth baggie. There's not organic broth? Yeah, this is an organic vegetable broth. You just want to look for vegetable broths that don't have any food additives or oil added to them. Because why? Why should we use so vegetable deep. broth that has oil added to it when we can avoid it? And then we have six cups of water. Now the next ingredient to go into the soup is lentil. And the soup is named yellow, or I'm sorry, split peas, yellow split peas. This soup is named yellow lentil soup because it's, um, I made up this recipe after a restaurant um, in Schaumburg, there's one in Lombard too called Pita House and I love their yellow lentil soup but it has a lot of oil in it and when I gave up oil 
um, I longed for it. I really wanted the soup. So I used all of the seasonings that I could tell that were in the soup, and they call their soup lentil soup. It's yellow. It's made with yellow split peas. So it might actually be made with red lentils. So you could use either one, whichever one you have. This one's going to take a little bit longer to cook because you're going to cook them down until they're nice and soft and thicken into the soup. Now, when working with lentils, who works with lentils here already? Any of you? Okay, good. So when working with them, or with split peas, or any dried beans, this one is in all of your local grocery stores. It's by Goya Yellow Split Peas. This is another one. Maybe you can tell me how to say this properly. Jana. How do you say this? Chana dal. Chana dal. Yes. This is another, it's a yellow Yeah, this is from pea. Indian stores. Right. You can find these here locally. Mm -hmm. They're a lot more inexpensive when we buy them in bulk right. like this. And then this is a red lentil, which you can find in these big bags yes. as well, mm -hmm. or in your regular grocery store in these smaller bags. So when working with them, sometimes they have little stones. And this recipe we're going with... Um, Three cups. You want to spread out a clean kitchen towel and pour, measure out your lentils. There should be two cups per pound. So you're going to need a bag and a half if you're buying them like this. I'm going to mix this and use some red. So we'll pour them out onto the towel. You do the same process if you were working with dried beans, dry, any dried um, chickpeas, anything like that, in any of the recipes. And you're just going to sort through them. And it feels really nice. I love the feeling. And look for any stones. Sometimes they end up during the processing. They end up in there. And if you leave one of the stones in there and you bite down on it, you could easily break your tooth. Oh, that's a very good idea. Yes. Do you do this at home? No, but no, I start No, you just take doing, your chances? Yeah, I wash five, six times and I, I start looking, you know, if I find anything. You know what? I, it's like working with dried beans was never something I learned to cook from my mother. And I never really did it. We didn't do a lot of cooking with dried beans. So I never learned this. And when I first started cooking with them, I learned the hard way, and I bit into one, and it was pretty, it was horrible. It was like chewing on sand. So, and fortunately, it was me that got the, the stone and not my friends that I was feeding. So I found one. So that was worth the effort, right? I avoided that, and I found one that looked kind of like a stone, but I think it's just dark. So then we're going to pick up this towel. This is what makes this process really easy. So you pick up this towel, and then I'm going to put it into a bowl. Or you could just put it directly into a strainer like this and rinse it in the sink. I'm putting it in a bowl of water because I don't have running water here today. So I'm just going to swish it around. And the reason I'm doing this is these lentils are stored in big containers, and they can collect dust wherever they're being stored, so we're cleaning them. They don't get washed out on the field when they're picking them. We wash all of our produce, so why wouldn't we wash our dried beans? So then we'll just strain the water off. It's a lot easier when you have a sink to work with. This is a really quick and easy recipe to throw together. It takes maybe 15 minutes to put it together and get it started on the stove when I'm not doing so much talking. But these are such a beautiful color, and we're just going to add those straight to our broth and our onions. Julie? Yes? How long would you have to uh, cook those since the yellow ones you said, the yellow split peas take a little longer to, to cook than the red um, they, It doesn't matter if you overcook them because oh. it's all going to turn into a thickened broth. We're not leaving them as a whole oh, I see. split pea or whole lentil. But um, if you were just, if you wanted to do this stove top and you wanted to make it happen really quick, I would suggest using the red lentils. These only take maybe, oh, seven minutes to cook to stay firm, to make them turn into the broth, I would say 15 minutes tops. 
As long as your veggies are nice and tender, the soup can be, you know, boiled for on low for 15 minutes. This <coughs> Where the yellow split peas will take about a half an hour to 40 minutes to really cook in on the pressure cooker, 11 minutes under pressure. But that doesn't include the time it takes to come to pressure and reduce. So it takes about the same time in a pressure cooker versus stove top. You're just not babysitting it. You're setting it and walking away. That's the difference. A lot of times people forget about a pressure cooker. You have to wait for the, the pressure to reduce. That's, that takes longer than 11 minutes. It takes about 10 minutes to bring it up to pressure, 11 minutes to cook, and then another 15 to 20 minutes to come back down. So then our next ingredient is a red bell pepper. We're gonna dice this. And I'm going to save my top and put it in my veggie broth baggie. Hmm. You want to dice everything that goes into this recipe small so that it's like a restaurant soup. If you notice, most restaurant style soups have a small dice on all their veggies. Homemade soups usually have a chunkier stew-like texture to them. And when I was making up this recipe, I really wanted it to duplicate uh, restaurant style soup from a Middle Eastern restaurant that I love. But it's up to you. If you like big chunks in your soup, go for it. It's less work then. <laughs> Any questions so far? No? You guys are so quiet today. It's because it's warm in here. It's finally warming up in Chicago. Okay, so we'll add this to the soup. And then we have two carrots and two stalks of celery. My, the celery this week was 99 cents for two Two, a two pack of hearts that were organic at my grocery store, so I bought a bunch of it. And carrots, these are always two very inexpensive ingredients I always keep in my refrigerator. They hold up well. And um, starting any soup, I always have these two in them. And carrots and celery, I found out that they actually increase in nutrition in their antioxidant value when you boil them. So it's a wonderful thing they're in all of our soups. So these as well, I want to make a nice small dice so I don't have a big chunk of carrot. It's just mixed throughout my soup. And if you're not comfortable with a big knife like this, start with a small one and just work with a couple pieces like this with a smaller knife. When I make a soup, you know, I don't cut it small. I just make a big one uh -huh. and then boil it and then I strain it. After that, those big pieces, I just put it in a blender and you, you blend know, it. Yeah, and then mix it again in the water. Mm -hmm. You could also do this in a food processor if you're arthritic and mm -hmm. you can't you can't work with the knife. Do this in a either mini chopper or a food processor. Fit it on the S blade or the slicing blade. And then that saves you the, the work or possible pain on your hands and your wrists. Mm -hmm. Now, eating a plant-based diet like this that's free of oils and animal products, you're going to have a reduction in inflammation in your body. So that's going to eliminate the arthritic pain and the inflammation you have in your hands or if you're arthritic in your hips or wherever you're experiencing this Excuse me. <laughs> Wherever you're experiencing pain, it is greatly reduced with eating an anti-inflammatory diet. So there's more benefits to eating a plant-based diet besides just saving money. So with the parsley, we're using the stems and tops. All of it is tender. If the stems are really, really fibrous, cut those off and put those in your veggie broth baggie. Now with herbs, we have a few regulars here in the class, and they've been stirring their herbs the way I suggested. I have a storing herbs video that's on YouTube and on protectiddiet.com you can visit and check out. But this is how I recommend that you store your parsley, cilantro, basil, dill, 
any herbs that you buy at the store, I want you to bring them home and put them in a nice big bowl, put them in your sink, run cold water on them, and take them in and out of the water, get all the dirt and sand, you'll see it run into the water, drain it out, do it a couple times till they're nice and clean. Then I want you to take a clean kitchen towel, a dry towel, and wrap up your herbs, cover them in a container. You could also do this in the produce bag that you bought them in. Just dry out the bag and put them back in with a towel. Now, if you change this towel out once a week, you're gonna preserve these herbs pretty much two to three weeks. So I use a lot of herbs in my dishes because this is just as good for you as if you ate kale. There's no difference. Any green leafy vegetables, they're gonna help you with your, with your circulatory system. They're gonna help to lower your blood pressure. We've gotta eat these green leafy vegetables. And if we can get them in our diet through parsley or cilantro, those are two of the most inexpensive ingredients in your grocery store. So I want you including them in all of your recipes. If you check out my website, there is parsley or cilantro in pretty much, or spinach or kale, pretty much in every single recipe. And that's not, there's no mistake to that. It's because they are super powerful at reducing our risks of heart disease and reversing heart disease, as I did. Julie, how soon would you guys um, reduction in your inflammation once you started? Um, I, well, I always use my mom as an example because she's kind of a funny example. She had arthritis really bad in her hands and she would soak her hands in hot water at night when she watched TV. She, she would insist that she liked washing dishes by hand rather than using her dishwasher washer because her hands hurt so bad. And she couldn't do small, tedious things because of the pain. And she adopted a protective diet and after about two or three months, it was gone. She put together this piece of furniture that I think she bought at Ikea and she couldn't even believe that she did it herself, that she used a screwdriver and everything. But she didn't tell me about it. And I think it was in her first month that she started to get relief because she said she didn't want to tell me because she wanted to make sure because she couldn't believe it herself. Because she, for years she was taking anti-inflammatory medication, over-the-counter stuff, and anything to relieve her pain. So you should experience after 30 days, if you do this 100%, which is what I recommend for all of my students to go for it, you're gonna produce an on average weight loss if you um, are overweight, about 10 pounds a month is the average. And the reduction in inflammation should happen with, after 30 days without a doubt. And oil, removing the oil out of this soup is key because oils are inflammatory. They are not good for us. They're marketed as health food, but they're an expensive ingredient that those companies that are selling them to you are marketing as health food, but they're not. They're healthier than butter, but they're not health food. So don't be mistaken. Just cut it out of the diet. You'll see, you'll see a dramatic difference in your body fat reduction and the inflammation in your body. So then we have, and that was one cup of parsley. If you wanna go two cups of parsley, which is what I do in our house, we eat a lot of herbs, we add them into our soups. It's only gonna add flavor, it's not gonna turn the soup green. <laughs> so, um, and parsley is an inexpensive ingredient to add a ton of nutrients and chlorophyll. There's just so many ingredients in that little leaf that are powerful protectors. So we have four cloves of garlic. And if you don't have a garlic press, I recommend them because then you don't have to touch the garlic. You could just use your knife. You don't have to peel it. And you can pop this peel off. Just like that. And guess where this peel's going? In my veggie broth bag. <laughs> So I love my Susie, I use a Susie garlic press. It's by Xylus, it's the Susie 2. It's my favorite one. Um, you could even leave the peels in there. It's gonna push the next few cloves through. That was like three little cloves put together. Um, garlic and onions are powerful, powerful foods to help our body defend against free radicals and cancer. So we include them in every recipe. 
And then you just scrape that out, put that in your belly broth bag. And then we have sea salt. This is optional. If you're on a low sodium diet, you can skip it. I want my foods to taste great, so I use a little bit of salt when, I'm, when someone's first getting started. Jerry and I have been eating this way for years, so we're able to cut back the sodium in our diet and things taste wonderful to us. But over time, I want you to, to visit that. Because if you're going on a totally salt-free diet, totally animal product-free diet, and all of your food tastes so bland that you can't stick to it for a long-term effect and produce results, reduce the inflammation, reverse heart disease, reverse type 2 diabetes, all of this can be done on a whole foods plant-based diet that's designed like a protective diet, including a little bit of salt to keep your food interesting. You could cut it out of the recipe and maybe just salt on the table if you're trying to reduce it dramatically. Um, I want you to stick to this full time 100%, not off and on because your food tastes too bland. The food has to taste fantastic for us to do this and make it a sustainable lifestyle to eat this way so that we're healthy long term, not on a diet for a week, I can't take it anymore, the food tastes terrible, and then you're back to ordering pizza or ordering Chinese or doing something that's super indulgent. I want you eating a healthful diet 100% throughout the rest of your life. So then we have oregano, dried oregano. And all the measurements are on the recipe. We have black pepper. And, sorry, this needs to be oiled. We don't use oil in the house, but I think I need to oil the pepper mill. Okay, smoked paprika. And this brings me to talking about the expense of spices. Smoked paprika adds a lot of flavor to this soup gives it that smoky, rich taste. Now, you could buy the smoked paprika at your regular grocery store, Jewel, um, what are the other ones around here? Maya. Meyer. You're gonna pay a lot of money for this little McCormick. I think I paid like $4. I forgot this for a cooking class one day and I had to run out to a regular grocery store and buy it. And I just lost out on $2 for this little, what is this? 0.9 ounce jar. Trader Joe's, 1.6 ounce smoked paprika was $1.99. Mm. So Trader Joe's has really good deal on spices. The other place that I shop for my spices is at Caputo's or your local fruit market, Valley Produce. Those markets, they have them in bags. Then you just get a spice jar and you refill your spice jar or you could recycle old spice jars as long as they're not really pungent and you can wash them clean. Um, cumin, that's the next ingredient. I buy this at my fruit market because it's a great deal for a big bag of it and I just get a big spice jar. I use this in a lot of recipes. This is ground cumin versus cumin seed. And Costco has a wonderful deal on chopped dried onions, on a lot of different spices. They don't always carry the same spices, but they always carry chopped dried onion. This is a, a very popular ingredient in a lot of my recipes. It adds a lot of flavor. So, spices. Don't buy your, your spices at the grocery store. The other tip I have is don't run low on spices. If, you're, if you notice, like, my oregano, it's getting low. It gets put on my list so that when I go to Costco, I remember to buy this because I don't want to buy a jar of oregano like this for $5. I want to buy a big jar of, like this for $4. So, that's just another little tip. And then we're going to mix this together and bring it to a boil. As you were, after you added your broth, it stopped the browning. And then you left, you turned the heat back on and let it all boil as you're adding all the ingredients. And then you can turn it down to like medium and let it simmer until everything becomes nice and tender and the soup thickens. Can we add the tomatoes also or not? You can add tomatoes, you can add anything to the base of this soup. The way that I wrote the recipe for this soup, I love it, hopefully you like it. Um, and it's typical of a Middle Eastern lentil soup. A lot of the flavors are similar in that. They wouldn't have a tomato in that soup base, but if you like tomatoes in your soup, go ahead and add them. The other way to boost the nutrients of this soup is you could add several cups of fresh baby spinach. When it's done cooking, they're just going to wilt. And anytime we can get those greens in there, it's good. So um, I just
just want to go over the benefits of buying these versus chicken or beef or fish to use in your soup. Um, they're very inexpensive. A small black bag like this is a little over a dollar a pound. So there we're going to save by using lentils instead of meat or fish or chicken. Um, the other way we're going to save is on our health, our co-payments, our medication. Lentils and beans, chickpeas, they help dramatically to reduce our cholesterol. Just the inclusion of a half a cup of beans or lentils per day in your diet over a two month period, you can reduce your cholesterol by 20 points. Now I've seen a reduction in cholesterol of 30 to 50 points in 30 days applying this diet. So just including these in a poor diet, adding them to what you're currently eating, you're gonna see a reduction if you have elevated cholesterol. Um, two tablespoons of beans, lentils, or chickpeas a day is going to reduce your risk of death by 8%. So we need to start eating these, these beans and lentils if we aren't already. If, they, if you look at um, communities across the globe, where they're eating the most of these, they don't have colon cancer in Africa. So it's not even existent. And they've correlated some ingredients in these that actually are, they defend against the free radicals that cause that cancer. So there's a great, greater reduced risk of cancer if we include beans and lentils in our diet. So that's pretty much it. We can go for the samples. I'm, I'm, I'm welcome to, you're welcome to ask any questions if anyone's confused about why no oil or... No, this is, you mentioned cumin um, with the seed. I, I found a recipe for beans that called for uh, cumin seed and um, coriander seed. So I went on and bought it. Uh-huh. And I put them in. They're spicy. Yeah, but it yeah. Was, it was, it, the flavor was great. Yeah. But then my husband said, oh my gosh, he said, what is this hard thing? I, I should have heard a little bank, but what do you call it, a little bouquet bag or, or in a cheesecloth or something? Cumin um, seeds, if you boil them in a sauce, they won't be hard, but if you're just tossing them on a I potato. Put, oh no, I, I boiled them with the beans, with the, in the beans, and they were really They should crunchy. be tender. Really? There's a recipe on the site for spicy curry. It's a free recipe. It's the foundation of any curry you usually start with cumin seeds. So, Typically, they put them in oil to release their oils, but all it is is the heat that releases the oil from the cumin seeds. So I put them in a dry pan, and I heat them. Just like you toast nuts, you're toasting the cumin seeds. And that releases the oil in the cumin seeds, and it will flavor the dish. But then I'm adding vegetable broth, and whatever else I'm adding to it, maybe I'm thickening it with either a rice milk or a soy milk and cornstarch, because I'm not using coconut milk. Um, and in that cooking process, they should soften up nicely. Maybe it was the coriander because it was like a little tiny little ball. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably the coriander seed. Yeah, it was just a little tiny little ball. It's probably what yeah. it is. So the other thing I want to talk about, I almost forgot about, was stretching the soup. So this soup is beautiful on its own, but we're going to put it on top of a grain. So today I have short grain brown rice, you could use long grain brown rice. As long as it's brown rice, we want to use our grains in a whole because the added fiber, fiber is the key to life. We want to eat all the fiber we can in our meals. So you might want to put it on top of brown rice pasta or whole wheat pasta or potatoes. You could bake some potatoes. There's a recipe for shortcut potatoes on the site. We cut them in half and bake them on a pan so they take less time. You could mash up a bunch of baked potatoes and put this soup on top of it. It's delicious. It's going to stretch the soup, the flavors in the soup, and then put it on top of a whole grain. You could put it on top of sliced corn tortillas. These are a whole grain. These are a major staple in my diet. Or you could bake them up into what I call salad chips. I cut up my corn tortillas and I bake them into these little squares and I add them to my salads for my grain portion of my salad because we want to eat starches in our diet. That's what makes eating a plant-based diet so good and sustainable. So I'm going to pass these around if you guys want to taste these. These are just baked 
corn tortilla chips. And you could use those as snacks. How many of you are buying chips or things like that in the grocery store as your snacks or crackers? Yes. Okay, you're spending a lot of money on potato chips, corn chips, and you're getting all the oils that come with them. Crackers, they're so high in fat and so expensive and you get very few in the bag. So pick up the corn tortillas. Oh, okay. How are you guys doing this? I don't want to think You're being super polite. Well, that's nice. Thank you. I baked. You baked the tortilla chip. Yep. Did you like them? We ate with beans today for lunch. It's uh -huh. good. Good, good. So you're making the tostadas and chips. Yeah. That's what you learned from my classes. Uh, that last, good. last week, How then did one class. Them? Um, it depends on your oven. There's a recipe on this postcard that I give out here to make these into chips. Please pick one of those up or you can go to the website for baked tortilla chips. This is a great way to save, save money, save fat calories, which we don't need. Fats are totally depleted of any nutrients that we need. We don't need to add any extra fats to our diet. So this is, this is a, a great way to save money. We're so fortunate here in Chicago to have El Milagro tortillas. If you haven't tried these yet, we ship these all over the country to our students. And we have students that are in other countries that wish we could ship them to them. So we're fortunate to have these here. Pick them up, very inexpensive, and they're a whole grain. Um, they're a staple in my diet. So also cracked wheat. You could make this. This is really easy to make. You could put, add it to your soups, or you just pour some boiling water over it in a bowl. It will swell after about maybe 15 minutes, and it's done. Cover it with maybe about a half an inch of boiling water over its level, and it's going to swell up. This is typically used in tabbouleh, which is a Middle Eastern salad. But I add it to soups to stretch my soup. So now I'm going to, I'm going to plate these up. And Jerry eats this way with me, of course, and he's got a bigger appetite sometimes than me. I have a pretty good appetite. I'm a good eater. But, um, so we stretch everything with the whole grains, with rice, so that it will last a little bit longer. Yeah. Ah, thank you. So this soup, when you finish cooking it, when you stir it, everything's going to go together. And right now the, the um, split peas are separated, but as you stir it, it's going to turn into a nice um, thick broth. I have a question. Sure. That um, rice, do you have to put there first or uh, just leave it like that? How, how am I going to use the rice? How am just I going to use the rice? Uh -huh. I'm going to put it into the bowl. Oh, so therefore you're not, you cannot put it there. And I would put it, it in there. You could, but it's going to absorb all of your broth. <laughs> So you want to keep it separate. Okay. So what I usually do is I use my pressure cooker to cook my rice, which I gave you the perfectly cooked brown rice recipe, which is a really helpful recipe to a lot of people. Um, I meet a lot of really busy people that don't know how to cook rice, and they buy frozen brown rice at um, the store. You can actually buy pre-cooked brown rice frozen. It's very expensive, but it's convenient to them. So then when I teach them how to cook brown rice on the stove top, it's very simple. But a lot of people can't get it right. They burn it or it's too watery. So there's a recipe for that. And then you can also cook your brown rice in a pressure cooker. That's the way I cook the rice we're having today. And I cook a big batch of it like this. And I keep it in my refrigerator for the week. Or I freeze small containers of it. And when I want rice, I can take it out of the freezer and heat it up really simply. Or just let it come to room temperature and pour my hot um, soup over it. Right, I'm just going to put a little bit in the bowl. If you want to help me, that would be great. You can be the soup filler. You want to come back here? Are you guys warm? 
Okay. We're we're working out the area.